Let's get your trading week started. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. Your equity market totally unchanged on the S&P 500. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York, coming up, First Republic's first quarter results after the close. Fed officials going quiet before next week's meeting and markets consider the dreaded debt ceiling X day. We begin with the big issue, wrapping up the banks, looking ahead to big tech. This is going to be a huge week for stocks. We've got a lot of tech companies. The biggest part of earnings season is actually going to be the tech reports. We still like the tech sector. We can see tech stocks up another 10% plus for the rest of the year. Big tech is relatively defensive. Overall, we're starting to see some stabilization. We've got strong balance sheet companies, highly cash generative, um, with relatively stable in terms of tech stocks, in terms of going to earnings, it's a green light to continue to own tech. We know that tech companies have done a lot of cutting since the end of last year, early this year. You've seen them cutting uh, headcount uh, dramatically. They already ripped a Band-Aid off on guidance. The question is, can they have a decent results? This is when we start to find out if they cut enough to preserve their margins and to offset the declines in revenue. Joining us now to discuss, Nuveen, Sarah Malik, Morgan Stanley, Dan Skelly. Sarah, first to you. I guess we've got to understand after a big rally year to date for big tech so far, will the earnings validate that move? You know, I think it's it's going to be a lot of hit and misses there. So something like Meta, the ones that have been ahead of the curve in terms of cost cuts, are, are probably going to have a, a better earnings quarter and outlook going forward. In technology, we actually like software and semiconductor companies better. So in the software space, we love the recurring revenue, the fact that they don't need to rely on pricing power to move forward and their strong backlog. So that's our top pick coming into the technology earnings over some of the mega caps where I think there could still be issues because they have to readjust their business models post the pandemic when, when they did a lot of hiring and plan for business that now has fallen off. Just a massive week packed full of mega cap tech earnings. Just to go through the calendar briefly for you. Tomorrow, Google and Microsoft. Wednesday, Meta. Thursday, we'll get Amazon amongst te Intel, Snap and others too. And then next week, Apple, May 4th. Dan Skelly, going into all of that, just to build on what Sarah was talking about, have they reset things enough? Have they cut enough for the challenges that might come later this year and beyond? John, it's a mixed bag. And, and so when you look at certain parts of the tech sector, sure, they've been de delivering cuts since last year. And you may see some other uh, of their brethren catch up this particular quarter. But again, it remains a mixed bag. I think a lot of the tech space has particularly accelerated and rallied off of the regional bank stress. Number one, because of their strong balance sheets, which is completely fair and efficient. But number two, the read through, as you know, and you, you've talked about all morning, is that the Fed's going to be cutting fairly shortly. And, and we just disagree with that. So we think that duration trade has largely been priced in for the sector. Going beyond that, it's not just about rate cuts and recession. There's some people, Sarah, that still believe in these secular headwinds and uh, tailwinds, rather, the cloud story for some of the big tech players. Sarah, do you subscribe to that theory that these tech names, these mega cap tech names are divorced from the cycle or are they more cyclical than perhaps we give them credit for? I think they're very dependent on yields. And what you saw just recently in this month is that as yields rose, technology companies took a breather versus the strong start that they've had for the year. So I don't think it's just all about do you want to own technology or not own technology because these companies look very different than they did in the past. Yet during the pandemic, many of them were hiring pretty excessively for growth rates that weren't sustainable. This ranges from big flagship companies like Apple, which has to resume, go back to its normalized growth rate that we saw pre the pandemic. Um, also, the cost bases are, are out of line for some of these companies. So I think you have to be much more selective in technology going forward. It's not just going to be about growth versus value. And I agree that also I, we don't expect Fed cuts, uh, rate cuts going forward. Um, we think the Fed likely is one and done in terms of rate hikes, and then it pauses. So it's not just going to be a trade for long duration stocks in a lower interest rate environment. You have to be much more selective in tech. And that's why we like companies like ServiceNow, that if we do go into a recession, IT budget should go more in their favor because they do help companies save money. These year today moves, the app performance phenomenal. Meta up by 76%, Amazon up by 27%, gains of almost 20% on Microsoft, on Alphabet. For the sector, this from Elena Popina and Jessica Menton here at Bloomberg. Take a listen to this. 
The information technology sector on the S&P 500 up 19% in 2023 compared with a gain of almost 8% on the S&P 500. That outperformance there, the strongest start to a year relative to the S&P 500 since 2009. Phenomenal. Kayleigh Lines has more down in D.C. Morning, Kayleigh. Good morning, John. Well, that outperformance is continuing in a marginal way this morning. If you look at futures, S&P 500 futures down, while NASDAQ 100 futures remain positive. So this really just continues the trend we have seen. As you said, we've seen a nearly 20% move to the upside for tech stocks. The S&P 500 has lagged behind year to date. And then when you look at that nearly 8% move for the S&P 500, we have to keep in mind that just five stocks, some of which you just mentioned, John, Apple, Microsoft, NVIDIA, Meta, and Amazon, have been responsible for two thirds of that advance in the S&P 500 this year. So it's quite the reversal of fortune compared to last year when tech was lagging hard as the Fed embarked on this aggressive hiking cycle. But it's now bets on the Fed turning around and beginning to cut this year that are fueling the rally uh, this time in a massive way that speculation has brought the S&P 500 technology index to trade at a multiple of almost 25 times future earnings. And Bloomberg Intelligence says to justify that multiple, the Fed would need to cut rates by at least 300 basis points. That is more than five times what the swaps market is currently pricing in. So there's a question as to whether or not this rally uh, can continue should those Fed expectations not be met, John. And of course, we'll see if the earnings over the next two weeks can help justify that expensive stock. What a busy week on the earnings front. Katie, thanks for that. Big tech very much in focus. Here's a line for you from Patrick Armstrong. If you feel safe owning Git, it's probably too expensive. That was Patrick Armstrong of Plurimi just last week. Take a listen to what he had to say. Mega, mega cap tech and quality growth is getting quite expensive. The risk isn't that these companies miss and fall off a cliff, but they are cyclically exposed and it may be a period of dead money where it takes a long time to catch up with the multiples that some of them are trading at now. If you feel safe owning it, it's probably expensive. And I think a mean reversion trade um, makes sense right now. Dan Skelly, I'd love your thoughts on this line. If you feel safe owning it, it's probably too expensive. John, that's the story of the S&P 500, period. When you think about 19 times forward earnings, that earnings might be 10 to 15% too high this year, the equity risk premium trading around 200 basis points, we think the overall market feels too safe. And look, to your point earlier, there's been a big rotation for the safety of technology given the balance sheets. And I agree with Sarah's comment, this is not the same sector as 20 years ago. There's higher free cash flow, there's less debt, there's more recurring revenues. And oh, let's not forget, the dollar is gonna potentially become less of a headwind. So look, those are all good things, but it doesn't prevent the fact that in an overall growth slowdown, tech is certainly gonna be susceptible to that because it's beta to the market. Sarah, you say investors should flock to safety. A question we've been asking now for weeks, what is safety? Is it mega cap tech? Is it European luxury? What's safety to you? I think what investors are worried about with the markets is whether this is the calm before the storm. So we, before we go into safety, let's talk about a couple of reasons for the bulls and for the bears. You know, what the bulls are excited about is that Q1 earnings look pretty strong. The VIX is under 17. Things look pretty calm out there. But a couple of things in, uh, bears need to are thinking about is that we're at 13 months after some significant rate hikes. What does that mean for the economy? And also a much tighter consumer credit cycle. What does that mean for the consumer? So when we talk about safety, we look for companies that are consistently growing their dividends. They have quality balance sheets, provide some income, tend to be lower volatility. They should be more resilient during a recession. And then another area we like, which doesn't really always make you think of safety, is emerging markets. We just talked about the weaker dollar potentially going forward. Also, a lot of EM countries are further ahead of the U.S. on the curve in terms of tightening, and they're even loosening. Valuations are much stronger, uh, much more in our favor in emerging markets. That's a, another area that we like where you can get a little bit more bang for your buck. You're both on the same page when it comes to EM emerging markets and I think a lot of people on the same page when it comes to international outperforming specifically Europe Europe overweight versus say the United States Miss Life Mateka this morning over at JP Morgan writing the following we know that Eurozone valuations versus the US continues to screen cheap but it appears that the consensus call these days is to be overweight Europe versus the US they say this we are remaining overweight Europe versus the US for now but we think that the time to take profits on the trade is approaching Dan are we approaching that point right now we're getting there, John. And look, this is a, a call that Morgan Stanley made back in the fall to favor East Asia, to favor EM, to favor Europe. And look, we don't think the magnitude of the outperformance continues from here. Let's face it, PMIs have surprised to the upside 
Europe got through a very mild winter and so that energy depression did not happen. And then China's been reopening, of course, in fits and starts. So you've seen that outperformance over the last three or four quarters. Uh, we don't think the magnitude repeats from here for the rest of the year, but you're likely to continue to see some marginal performance there. Great note just popped into my inbox from Savita Subramaniam over at Bank of America and the team who say the following. We see 10 reasons for upside risk in stocks versus bonds and cyclical sectors within the S&P 500 this quarter, including bearish sentiment, a widely expected recession, active funds purging cyclical positioning, dry powder in private equity, downward pressure on the equity risk premium and seasonal market trends. Sarah, I'll go through that again if you want me to, but from what you heard, what do you make of that call? I think generally we look at we prefer fixed income over equity at this point. Mostly it's because we talked about some of those headwinds for equity and we, it comes down to valuation. The S&P at 4100 and change is basically pricing in a soft landing and that's a narrow path and most likely we get a mild recession. Now you go over to fixed income, high quality, high yield fixed income, double B rated corporate bonds. You can get six plus percent returns, even up to eight percent returns. To us, that's very attractive in terms of getting higher, reaching for higher yield but also uh, taking a little bit less risk. Another area that we like is infrastructure. This is a sector that tends to be recession resilient. So uh, the components of infrastructure like waste management and utilities tend to perform okay during a recession. So we're, we're looking for areas which either you can get strong returns or that are more e easier to survive during a recession. Dan, I'll give you the final word here. Bank of America, they say upside risk in stocks versus bonds. Are you taking the other side of that? We are at the moment, John, and I'm not sure what calendar they're looking at, but seasonally we know we're going into the kind of traditional sell in May period as well. And look, when we think about the overall positioning of the market, there are three key known unknowns that the equity market has just been too complacent about to date. Number one, what will be the commercial bank, the regional bank's effect of slowing lending on commercial real estate, small businesses, and the overall economy? Our folks think it takes five quarters to see the ultimate impact there. Number two, Will it take more market volatility to force a compromise on the debt ceiling? That's a very contentious argument coming up over the next several months. And number three, and we've talked about it, and in particularly in light of number one and number two, what will the Fed choose in terms of fighting inflation still, which has been sticky, or will it be favoring short-term growth and financial stability? So given those three known unknowns, we think the equity market's too complacent here. We're going to talk about the banks in just a moment. Sarah Malik, Dan Skelly sticking with us. The broader equity market totally unchanged on the S&P 500. With some movers, here's Abby. Well, John, it's interesting because, of course, there's $16 billion worth of market cap reporting this week. Most of it is big tech, but there are other companies, too, including Coca-Cola this morning, which beat both top and bottom line estimates. Organic revenue up 12 percent. Public venue sales really offsetting rising costs as folks are out and then back out after the pandemic. Now, Tesla, these shares are down just a little bit. They've increased their forecast for CapEx uh, and are now budgeting about $7 billion amid the price cuts. But the big laggard on the day, Bed Bath & Beyond, it is the end of an era. The stock basically uh, at zero. This is they filed for bankruptcy. The st stores will be winding down by uh, June 30th, looking for a buyer. More than 480 stores being closed, John. Abby, thank you. More on that in about 15 minutes' time. Coming up, Closing out U.S. bank earnings. I think there's been a, a bit of a divergence in the performance across the group, uh, but by and large, we saw regional bank deposits, you know, pretty stable. Earnings from First Republic coming after the closing bout. That conversation coming up shortly. This was a unique, uh, I don't want to describe it as crisis, this is a unique period in the banking system. What was incredible is you got hurt two ways because your assets on the balance sheet were getting hurt because yields moving higher. At the same time, your funding costs were going up significantly, so you were getting hurt on both sides. It's today, a lot of the assets on banks' balance sheets are yielding three and a half, and they're funding them at five and a half. That is a losing proposition. Great conversation with the brilliant Rick Reader and David Weston on Wall Street Week over the weekend as we put the numbers on a quarter of pain on both sides of the Atlantic. Credit Suisse lifting the lid on a grim Q1, reporting $69 billion of outflows and a large write-down at its wealth management unit. This is another battered bank prepares to report stateside. First Republic earnings coming after the closing bout, with shares already plunging 88%. 
this year. Your team coverage starts right now with Bloomberg's Manus Cranny from Zurich, alongside Shanali Basak here in New York. And Manus, first to you, putting those numbers on a grim Q1 ahead of UBS tomorrow. They are. I mean, if you want to understand or, or get a whiff of what fear really is in the middle of a banking crisis, it's that 60 billion walked out the door. These are yielding assets at credit. Suisse, where did they flow to? We'll know a little bit more tomorrow when I sit down with Sergio Amotti. But it could have been worse. City reckoned 100 billion would walk out the door. It wasn't as brutal as that. But Credit Suisse have warned, Jonathan, there will be more losses. They will be substantial. So assuming that this is perhaps the worst of the flow show, not at all. There's a goodwill write down. There is more brutality to come here. The job of Sergio Motti, Colin Kelleher, and Iqbal Khan is to convince those clients, those families, those institutions around the world to stay the course, stay with the bank. And of course, inherent in that is convincing the rainmakers within the institution of Credit Suisse to stay the course. Their long term incentives are worth virtually nothing. There needs to be a new plan. 9% of the assets went out the door in these three months. 170 billion went out the door over the past six months. You've got to ask the question, and I will tomorrow from uh, Motti, which is where is the pain point in this trade? You pay 3.3 billion for 1.3 trillion in assets, but in wealth management, where's the inflection point on the flow show? Where does this trade begin to look a little bit less like Le Ballon d'Or? and something a little bit more whiffy, which Credit is Suisse unlikely, I today, should add. UBS tomorrow, and in between First Republic. Manus, we've got so much to talk about tomorrow. Shanali, before we get there, we've got to talk about First Republic a little bit later. Yeah, certainly after the market closes today, we will hear from First Republic. This is the giant in the room with the American mid-sized regional banks, if you will. Remember, there was $30 billion worth of deposits put in from the largest banks. The expectation here is that First Republic comes in with about $137 billion worth of deposits. Even that is significantly lower than the 176 that it had, almost 40 billion more in the prior quarter. Now, the question is, do they meet that expectation and do they signal a stabilization? Remember, when we're talking about First Republic, we're also talking about worries about a hole in its balance sheet that amounts to tens of billions of dollars. How big is that? Is there some stability? Do they need to do anything else? A lot of unanswered questions alongside earnings. Do they announce anything else, potential asset sales, anything else here, John, to show that they can make it through the rest of the storm. Shanali, we'll catch up with you tomorrow on that and after the closing panel a little bit later when those numbers drop. Manus, just tremendous reporting on this story from Zurich. Manus, Shanali, Francine Lacroix for that as well over the last number of weeks, the last month. What a quarter it was. The broader equity market just about unchanged on S&P 500 futures. Sarah Malik, Dan Skelly back with us. Sarah, do you have the clarity that you need on the banking sector after a chaotic month of March in a brutal Q1? Well, first quarter actually has been a relief for many of these large banks. They've beaten earnings by about 15% on average, but we have not been positive on the banks for over a year for three key reasons. One is we expect continued net interest income pressure going forward. Because of the mini banking crisis, we also think regulations will be tighter and more competition for deposits. And also, many of these deposits have flowed to the large banks. We should start to see some attrition in, going, going forward where they start to flow back, maybe to the mid-side banks. We'll see what, what First Republic says later today. So if we were looking at the banking sector, which we don't favor, we're looking for well-diversified banks like Morgan Stanley or something like ING that is a high-quality bank. But that's where you need to stick in a sector that's going to continue to have headwinds. Dan, where are you and the team on this sector now? John, we're still relatively cautious, and, and we've been underweight for, for some time. I think, to, to Sarah's point, not only do you have profitability issues for the regionals, they're the ones who are most exposed to commercial real estate, of course, as well, right? And so when you think about those carry trades of the, the era of zero cost of capital coming on, wow, we are starting to see notable uh, updates there. The second thing I'll say has to do with regulatory clarity. So when you think about the big banks, to Sarah's point, they have been cleaning up balance sheets for over 10 years. They're more exposed to a strong consumer and on the resi side of things, which is held up just fine. But when you look at, again, the regulatory environment for the regionals, it's evolving. We're going to hear in May and June new rules related to capital ratios, liquidity requirements, et cetera. And so when I think about the backdrop, John, the events of the last month or so in terms of the quick actions from the Fed and the FDIC have certainly probably been credit sensitive and credit friendly. But when you think about the equities in terms of new capital ratios, a growth slowdown, potential slowing of buybacks, there's still some pain to come, we think. Dan, it was pretty clear 
in the earnings reports that we got last week, and Sarah alluded to this, that earnings were okay relative to expectations, but net interest margins almost across the board for some of those smaller banks came down. If NIMS are coming down and they're going to face regulatory headwinds in a way that you described and mentioned just moments ago, can't you just conclude from that, Dan, that growth is ultimately going to get hit because lending is going to contract? It, it has to, and John, that makes sense. But even prior to the events of the last month with SVB, et cetera, you were starting to see lending requirements tighten anyway, right? So we definitely see some impact here. Again, it's a time horizon thing. We estimate it takes four to five quarters to see the ultimate impact. Ellen Zentner, as you know, who heads up our U.S. economics team, has already shaved off about a half a point of U.S. GDP from her estimate this year. And oh, by the way, we were not growing at a substantial level before that. So it, it really is, in our opinion, uh, yet to come in terms of the growth slowdown. So, Dan, a lot of people would say this is a feature, not a bug in monetary policy. This is the goal. And it's going to lead to lower inflation, lower growth, lower rates. And, Dan, for that reason, I want to buy tech. Why don't I want to buy tech? Because of the sensitivity to the overall economy, it's tend to have a beta higher than the market. There are some cyclical revenue streams and they're related to advertising, consumer spending, related to uh, semiconductors, et cetera. And, and so look, I think there are other areas of traditional safety that make more sense, be it in the healthcare area where you're getting innovation and growth, albeit at a much more reasonable price. You're seeing it in some of the consumer staples, including this morning, in terms of the pricing power there. So frankly, there are better areas that are more traditional areas of safety that make sense for, for tech at the moment. And look, final thing I'll say, Jonathan, has to do in terms of the sticky inflation, right? And so when you think about it, we've seen a tremendous amount of levers pulled to go from 9% CPI to 5% today. We've seen money supply collapse. We've seen China reopen and supply chains ease. And we've seen oil and gas way off their pre-invasion highs from the spring of last year. So that's been from nine to five. How do we get from five to two? We don't see that happening without more disruption in the economy and the labor market. Dan Skelly, Sarah Malik, to the two of you, thank you. Coming up next on this program, your morning calls and later, the debt ceiling debate in Washington, why the showdown is keeping Mike Schumacher of Wells Fargo bullish on bonds. But he's basically unchanged. Let's get used to morning calls. City downgrading first solar to south, seeing a challenging long term outlook. Your second call from B of A upgrading Ally Financial to neutral, expecting net interest margin pressures to start easing. And finally, Truist downgrading Regions Financial to hold, highlighting mounting regulatory headwinds. That stock is negative 2.5%. Coming up, Mike Schumacher of Wells Fargo joins us at the opening bell, making the case for duration as the debt ceiling showdown unfolds in DC. Your opening bell up next. Three seconds away from the open and bow this morning. Good morning. This Monday morning, your equity market down just 0.1% on S&P 500 futures, which is precisely where this market was through last week, down just 0.1% and going absolutely nowhere on the S&P. Hasn't felt like a snooze. It's just looked like a snooze. That's the opening bell. Switch up the board and get to the bond market. Anything but a snooze in the Treasury market over the last couple of months. Yields on a 10-year, 353, down about four basis points, in and around 350. Kind of stabilised around that level on a 10-year maturity. On a two-year, through the whole of last week, Monday through Friday, the two-year yield above 4%. And again this morning, even with yields coming in a couple of basis points, your two-year 416. Euro dollar back through 110, 110.18. The euro against the dollar positive a third of 1%. And crude, south of 80, $77 and about 60 cents. We're down about a third of 1% on the session. About 30 seconds into this session, we look like this on the S&P. On the S&P, we are totally unchanged on the Nasdaq. We're down by around about a tenth of 1%. One stock to watch out the open is Bed Bath & Beyond. Shares plunging after a bankruptcy filing put an end to the retailer's last-ditch efforts. The company wrote in an email the following. Our stores are open and serving customers. However, we have initiated a process to wind down operations. Abby, 
has more. Hey, Abby. Well, John, this is really pretty amazing. And of course, this possibility of bankruptcy, what is reality now? They did, of course, file for Chapter 11 bankruptcy yesterday. Uh, it's been speculated upon, and here it, it is. It has happened. The company simply collapsing under years ago, making the choice to put way too much merchandise, it seems now, and even seemed then, uh, into their stores. Then you couple that with e commerce and then the pandemic. That was really the nail in the coffin. Now, they will be winding down by June 30th. They are looking for a, a, a buyer. They will be liquidating nearly 500 stores. That includes the Bye Bye Baby stores. And of course, those iconic coupons, which, John, I'm guessing you don't use, but I still have some of them in my car right now. You can't use them after April 26. So this is really the end of an era here. As for the investors, if we take a look at the chart, this is really pretty amazing because just two years ago in Meme Mania, this was a $53 stock. It is now a 21 cent uh, stock from the peak, the real peak, uh, down even more. But anyway, you slice and dice it, basically uh, wiping out all of its market cap, a case study probably for generations to come of B-School students what not to do uh, here for Bed Bath & Beyond, again, filing for bankruptcy. Always sad when this stuff happens. Abby, thank you. Lots of response on the south side. This from Piper Sandler. Expecting a number of retailers to benefit from the bankruptcy over at Bed Bath & Beyond, saying this. Bed Bath & Beyond has been a multi-year share donor and leaves $6.2 billion in sales up for grabs. We believe we're entering a new phase of retail industry consolidation, with Target and Walmart being the long-term beneficiaries. Again, Bed Bath & Beyond down by 29%. Also looking at Tesla, raising its CapEx forecast for 23 to as much as $9 billion. That's a billion dollars more the company projected back in January. Ed Ludlow has more. Morning, Ed. Yeah, good morning, Jonathan. We're down by a percentage point at Tesla following the open. Not as deep a decline as we saw in the pre-market when that regulatory filing first hit. As you said, a minimum of $7 billion, a maximum of $9 billion at both ends of the range. That is a $1 billion boost. And actually, it's something that Tesla did a number of times between mid-2022 and present, boosting the CapEx forecast at a time where they're cutting prices on EVs here in North America. They did recently just re-raise prices on Model S and Model X and internally a view on cutting costs is a big focus but reminder of Elon Musk's commitment to sustaining growth at the expense of margin and profit that's something that he's been relatively clear on and while the sell side at least are a little concerned about the impact of price cuts to products on that bottom line at least Tesla is consistent on the view of investing through periods like this to maintain that growth rate. The stock is down about 1%. Not a big move for that name, all things considered. Ed, thanks for that, mate. Thanks for the update. I want to turn to earnings. Dan Skelly of Morgan Stanley alluded to this one. Coca-Cola successfully raising prices and delivering strong revenue growth. The CEO doubling down on the year ahead, writing this. We are confident in our ability to deliver on our 2023 objectives. Katie Greifat joins us with more. Hey, Katie. Hey, John. Yeah, people are buying soda, and Coca-Cola expects that people are going to continue buying soda. You can see that the shares are up about 1.3% right now. And if there's a takeaway, you spelled it out really nicely. It's that Coca-Cola still very much has pricing power here. We learned that customers, they're willing to pay up for Coke products at live events and that's helping to offset some of the company's still high input costs. So you add that together and all told Coca-Cola beat on adjusted EPS and on organic revenue. Adjusted EPS came in at 68 cents, three cents higher than the average analyst estimate. And in organic revenue, it grew by 12 percent in the quarter. That's versus the average analyst estimate of about 9.6 percent. Even still, Coca-Cola maintained its full year revenue forecast in a range of 7 to 8 percent, John. Thank you, Katie. Thanks for that. Just distracted by getting a little bit more information about what's happening with the debt ceiling debate. I want to get you the update with Emily Wilkins. Morning, Emily. Morning, John. So obviously the debt ceiling debate, Republicans face a critical test this week. Can they actually pass their own plan of what they would cut to then raise the debt limit? Um, at this point, it's not really clear that that's something that they're going to happen. McCarthy, of course, is confident, saying he will be bringing to the bill to the floor this week. But you have some moderate members who have concerns. You have some hardline Republican members who have concerns about work requirements and the amount that folks will need to actually work per week to get federal benefits. Uh, and it's not clear that how leadership is exactly going to be addressing some of those concerns and whether or not they'll be able to get all Republicans on their side. Of course, the key here, the key goal for McCarthy is to make sure that he's putting pressure on President Biden to get back to the table and to negotiate with him and the Republicans. He knows that whatever 
whatever bill passes this week is not going to be the final bill. We still have plenty of negotiation to do before we actually get to that X date and figure out whether or not, or what it looks like, rather, to raise the debt limit. Emily, thanks for that. Let's get to Mike Schumacher of Wells Fargo for the latest on this. Mike, I've been looking forward to having this conversation with you. It feels like slowly the T-bill market is now starting to price some of this tension in. Can you walk me through what you're seeing at the moment, Mike? Yeah, John, it's been really interesting. If you think about the last week, tax date was the 18th. And at that point, people became super concerned about the debt ceiling. It had never gone away, but it was out of focus, I, I think, a bit with all the bank troubles. And now we look at the T-bill market telling us is you've got a, just an enormous difference in bill yields. There's a huge aversion to June, July, and August bills. I'm going to give you some numbers. So May 30th Treasury bill yield is call it 360, something like that. June 6th T-bill, so just a week later, 470, 475, 100 basis points plus premium, if you will, to avoid June. Now, it goes up a little bit from there, but people are saying, don't give me that June stuff. I don't want July. I don't want August. I want to stay out of trouble. Mike, if that tension continues to build, do you see it isolated in that part of the T-bill curve, or do you see it spilling out somewhere into the Treasury market in a way that's currently un unanticipated? Yeah, we think it spills much more broadly, John. And it's, it's very interesting. I think Emily's point was very telling. Can the Republicans pass a bill? We don't know. And that's why people are so concerned about the debt ceiling. So if there's a lot more discussion, if this bill doesn't go through this week, I suspect you're going to see Treasury yields come down dramatically across the spectrum. So two year down a bunch, 10 year down 25, who knows, maybe 50 basis points if things really go off the tracks. But across the curve, it's a risk off event in our view. Mike, a risk off event, I think we can all agree on. It's Treasury yields going lower that you're getting some pushback on. Mike, there are some people who believe that maybe it's different this time around, that you don't run two treasuries, you run away from them. What's your greatest pushback against that argument at the moment? Yeah, it's pretty tough to buy that one, John. When you think about risk-off events globally, people say, oh, gee, I'd, I'd love to avoid the U.S. dollar. I'd like to put my money somewhere else. Well, that, that all sounds good, but where would that be? So if you've got lots of dollars to deploy, lots of risk to deploy in general, the U.S. markets are so deep, so liquid, people can't just go running over to the boon market. The Treasury market is 10 times as big as the boon market. Can't go to the gilt market. Canadian government bond market, I don't think so. Japanese government bond market, 90% plus owned by domestics and a huge portion owned by the BOJ. So there simply is no other good spot to go. If people want to shift risk out of, take your pick, equities, credit, what have you, they really need to go into U.S. assets. So I think that's the best counter argument. So Mike, do you think that politicians in Washington have the luxury of falling around on this topic? I think it's a bit of a game of chicken, John. So you've got President Biden, Speaker McCarthy, Chuck Schumer, et cetera, all kind of looking at each other and saying, well, how close do we dare get? And our concern is that perhaps they get just a little bit too close to the edge and markets get super concerned. So there's enough latitude now, enough time, I would say, to recover and get a deal done. But the big issue in the markets is as April ticks into May and as we get toward mid, late May, I think people get very, very concerned. Mike, we're starting to see volatility between the bond market and what's happening in the equity market almost diverge. I'm looking at what's happening with rates volatility, and it's still elevated. And equity volatility, the VIX, so to speak, has, has come back down. Mike, what do you make of what's happening there? Yeah, it's sort of a telling sign, John, when you've got really very high delivered volatility in the bond market. Now, a bit less over the last week or so, but just enormous delivered vol for weeks. Less delivered volatility in the equity market. So... Thinking about markets like options traders, if the 10-year Treasury yields moving 10, 15 basis points per day, they can rationalize having implied vols very high. Equities simply have not produced that level of volatility. There's more of a wall of cash staying in the stock market right now, is my take. Mike, we're going to continue this conversation around the Federal Reserve. Can't believe we talked about the bond market for about five, six minutes without discussing the Federal Reserve. Mike Schumacher of Wells Fargo will stick with us. The broader market right now, about 10 minutes into the session, we are positive by 0.1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we are positive by 0.1%. Also, the Russell, just a little softer, negative. Coming up on this program, all eyes on the data as the Fed goes dark. If data show continued strength in the economy and slower disinflation, we may have more work to do. That conversation, up next.
This is Bloomberg Z Open. I'm Lisa Mateo, live in the principal room. Coming up, Howard Buffett, founder of the Howard G. Buffett Foundation. That conversation at 2.30 p.m. Eastern, 7.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. This data-dependent risk management framework has led me to support the FOMC's response of rapid monetary policy tightening. If tighter financing conditions are a significant headwind on the economy, the appropriate path of the federal funds rate may be lower than it would be in their absence. But if data show continued strength in the economy and slower disinflation, we may have more work to do. It's a busy week of economic data as the Fed goes quiet ahead of next week's rate decision. Investors looking ahead to another round of jobless claims, US GDP, PCE and PMIs all on deck. Katie Lines has more. Hey, Katie. Yeah, John, it's a lot for the Fed to parse through when it makes its decision next week. But arguably, Friday's data may ultimately be the most important because that is when we get PCE deflator as well as the employment cost index. So the Fed's preferred gauges of prices and wage pressure. And as the inflationary read, that remains critical as the market expects because of ongoing inflationary pressures, the Fed is going to hike 25 basis points next week. That, though, is seen as likely the last hike of this cycle. Yes, the market thinks we have more than 25 basis points to go to get to terminal, but they don't expect that we will stay there for very long because right now pricing indicates that this Fed is going to turn around and start cutting rates by the end of this year to the tune of more than 50 basis points. This is where the other economic data comes in. Do we start to see further cracks and weakness forming and signal a softening economy that would support the case of more dovish members of the committee like Austin Goolsby, or do they support more hawkish members like Jim Bullard, who think the banking system and economy are resilient enough to take additional rate hikes even beyond beyond May. To put it in the words of Anna Wong over at Bloomberg Economics, there's more disagreement among committee members than meets the eye. And that level of uncertainty around the economic and Federal Reserve policy is what has led to elevated volatility in the bond market. Yes, the move index has come off of its highs of the year, but still we are quite high relative to history, John. Kelly Lines, thanks for that. I appreciate it. And I couldn't agree more. There is a big, big divergence within the Federal Reserve that we don't talk about enough because we often talk about the median dot in the so-called dot plot and plot that against market pricing for rate cuts so far this year. If you go into the SCP, and we've talked about that a few times on this program, that's a summary of economic projections for, say, 2024. The range on rates for 2024 on the FOMC is anywhere from 3.4% to 5.6%. That's the range from 34 to 5.6%. Mike Schumacher back with us from Wells Fargo for more. Mike, do you think we make too much about that so-called difference between what the market is pricing, and I'll come back to that in a moment, and what the Federal Reserve is projecting. I actually like your point on the range, John. I think that's the key one here. When you, you consider a turning point in policy, whether it's the Fed or any other institution, that's when people tend to disagree. It's very difficult to call the exactly appropriate time to switch from tighter policy to standing pat to easier policy. I think that's a natural time for disagreements to manifest and that at least is in my view why you've got such an enormous range for next year and why the market struggles to price it. I think we're struggling to price in that's the point Mike we often talk about the bond market the rates market pricing in rate cuts and Mike I've had a couple of guests over the last week or so Gerson Distenfeld of Alliance Bernstein Ed Al Husseini a little bit earlier this morning pointing out to be careful here that this is about a weighted average of two different scenarios, the probability of one occurring and maybe not the other. Either we don't need rate cuts at all or we need tons of rate cuts. Now, Mike, are we at this situation right now where we all talk about how much is priced into the bond market, but ultimately it's either too much or not enough? I agree with that scenario. And basically it all goes back to the Fed leaving that punch bowl at the party way too long. And now you've got a bunch of people staggering around and it's got to say, well, OK, We've got a call it a moderate probability of a very large cut. Maybe it's 200 basis points over the next 12 months or so, or a pretty hefty probability of no move. And the market weights this, of course, and it winds up with, oh, well, if you look from, let's say, the peak this year to the ending point of 2023, it's 55 or 60 basis points. I think it's really inaccurate to consider that to be, call it two 25 basis point cuts. It's much more the case something goes badly wrong. The Fed reacts by going 100 basis points or perhaps more in a meeting or two, and boom, you've got a very different scenario. So the market struggles to try to assign these 
call it moderate to smallish probabilities. I think it's a natural course, and I agree with Karishan and your other guests that that's, that's the way you've got to think about that right now. Mike, with that in mind, is it easier to think about how the longer end might develop relative to, say, the two-year spot and into the belly of the curve? I think it probably is, John, and we've had this discussion with a lot of clients. People will say, well, hey, you've got this big inverted curve right now between the two-year and the 10-year treasury or the 30-year, whatever you like to focus on. Why is that? Very different investors active on the front and the back ends, as much as I've seen that divergence in many, many years. So when we think about the long-end investors, how does their calculus change? What do they look at? Well, for pensions, for instance, they focus on the relative performance of equities versus bonds. For life insurers, it tends to be more tied to absolute yield levels. These things are not as directly impacted by Fed policy as the two or the three-year Treasury. So I think you're right. It's much easier to focus in this particular context on long-term rates. Now, our view is that we're bullish for the next, call it, month or two or perhaps three while the debt ceiling drama plays out. After that, I suspect a bit more bearish. But a lot more variability in our call, and I think the market's call for the front end. For the back end, it's, it's a much more stable environment, in our view. So, Mike, just to be clear, that call on the 10-year, that's a tactical call? It's a short-term call around the debt ceiling debate? That's exactly right, John. It's event-driven. And event-driven calls are tough. It's not a function of core CPI goes to X, we change our call, or core PCE does whatever it might do on Friday. It's not like that. It's very much tactical very much driven by the debt ceiling per se. As you take a longer term view then, Mike, of the bond market at the long end and start to think about things like inflation, I'd return back to that piece that came out from the IMF a couple of weeks ago talking about a return to pre-pandemic interest rates. Do you see it quite the same way? No, definitely not. When you think about the IMF's view, it's taken a very, very long term view. For us, we look at it and say, what are the motivations of the central bankers? What do they care about? They care about real yields. Real yields on the U.S. long end, in our view right now, are too low. Now, set aside the next month or two or whatever it might be until the debt ceiling is done. But beyond that, when you think about a real yield of a 10-year Treasury of 110, 120 basis points, that's really not going to get the job done. So we think real yields need to go up. Now, some of this happens as inflation comes down, but also probably nominal yields have to go up in time, too, to make that occur. So to push reals up to 150 and keep them there for a while, that's more of a long-term bear call, but again, we have to get through the next few months until we make that happen. Interesting. Thanks for the clarity on that, Mike. Appreciate it. Mike Schumacher there of Wells Fargo on this bond market, making that short-term event-driven call around the debt ceiling debate for lower interest rates, lower yields, so to speak, on a 10-year, but ultimately, over the long term, elevated real yields. Right now, nominal yields down about three basis points on a two-year at 4.15 percent. On a 10-year, down about four basis points there to 3.53. That's the bond market taken care of. The broader equity market about 22 minutes into the session. Positive by 0.1 percent on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq up by 0.1 percent there. Big week for the Nasdaq 100. Talked about those tech earnings. I'll go back through the calendar again for you. Tomorrow, Google and Microsoft. Wednesday, Meta. Thursday, Amazon. On to next week, we'll hear from Apple. Next Thursday, I believe, May 4th. That's the same day as the ECB decision. May 3rd, the Federal Reserve. And then on to payrolls on Friday. So this week, next week, it's going to be a big couple of weeks. Let's get you some sector price action. Here's Abby. Well, John, with the S&P 500 barely moving higher in the morning, not surprisingly, the sectors beneath not moving all that much either. The best sector is consumer discretionary, really being helped out by Amazon ahead of that big report. Services, communication services after it. Interestingly, real estate and utilities down, even with yields lower. Typically, those dividends look more attractive. Let's weigh back in, though, on this week's big tech earnings, and that, of course, is with the year-to-date moves. It's really stunning. A $16 trillion worth of market cap reporting this week, and among this year's best sectors, uh, discretionary, tech, and consumer discretionary, all up more than 15%. The worst sector on the year, financials, down just 3%, though, at this point, John. Abby, thank you. Looking ahead to First Republic a little bit later after the close. Up next, your trading diary, live from New York. This is Bloomberg.
25 minutes into the session, we are just about positive on the S&P 500, up by two-tenths of 1%. A little more than 40% of the market cap on the S&P 500 reporting this week, thanks to Stuart Kaiser of City for that stat. Busy week of earnings, particularly for big tech. Mega cap tech just around the corner. The Nasdaq positive by two-tenths of 1%. That's the equity story. In the bond market, yields come in just a little bit, down three on a two-year, 4.15 on a 10-year, down four to about 3.53. In and around 3.50 more broadly over the last week or so, finding a bit of stability there, for now at least. That's the price action. Let's get to the trading diary. First Republic after the closing bell later this afternoon. Alphabet, Microsoft, those earnings on Tuesday. Meta on Wednesday, followed by Amazon and Intel on Thursday. Plus, Q1 GDP and another round of jobless claims. And finally, rounding out the week with PCE, New Mitch Consumer Sentiment Survey and Personal Income Numbers. And that rounds out the morning for me. Looking forward to covering a busy week with you all. Thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV and good luck for the rest of the training day. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg.